Um, I'm Victoria, I'm a data scientist at Quantum Black London office, and um, I'm also I'm also a fairness R and D lead uh, at Quantum Black, and together we are shaping the future of uh, machine learning. And one part of it is, of course, taking into account what kind of effects it can have on the humans' lives. Um, so this talk I wanted to dedicate to algorithmic fairness and think about how we can build machine learning models with a human face, the ones that don't harm anyone but do good. At Quantum Block, uh, we work with a very broad variety of different clients and oftentimes we work with individual data. Um, and based on this individual data and the models that we built, uh, very important decisions are being made. And in general today, uh, as many of you of course know, um, many, many decisions are being made uh, for people that are very, very consequential. Um, and of course, um, some of them are uh, pretty dramatic, like you know whether or not a person would be let out of prison. Uh, and some of them are super important stages in life, like uh, transitioning from school to uh, to college, and uh, the, the algorithm would decide whether or not you should be admitted into a specific college. Um, and uh, some of them, uh, some of these decisions are a bit more mundane but also very consequential in the long run. For instance, um, what kind of Im images are you being shown while searching um, the web? What kind of movies are you being recommended? What kind of songs are you being recommended? All of these things, they uh, seem not really important, uh, you know, in our day-to-day -day lives, but they're actually shaping us as individuals and they can have very profound impact on the societal fabric and the way that we think about ourselves and the way that we think about others. So uh, when it comes to decisions, small and big, uh, and the algorithm that are being used uh, to make them, uh, there is no such thing as uh, no, no impact, if you think about it. So whenever we're dealing with the data on the individuals, and we build the machine learning models to use them to make decisions, we should be very careful about the potential consequences of that. And um, this diagram helps you um, sort of put things into perspective and think how the modeling results are fed back into the world and uh, how they're then, um, in a bit of a time, are being used uh, as a form of the data. Data is the fuel of our machine learning algorithms. And if the data contains some um, societal biases, there is no way machine learning algorithms would not pick it up. And then if we make the future recommendations or future decisions based on, on this disturbed reality that the machine learning models learned, we will just reinforce this vicious cycle and strengthen that. And this is exactly what we want to avoid. So when you think about machine learning, think about it as a loop. Like we see the uh, individuals doing um, something, like living their lives. And then we know that uh, this will be um, reflected in the state of the world that we only can measure with the data that we're collecting. And we're collecting tons of that, right? Uh, you know, what kind of activities you were doing on the internet, you know, um, all the socioeconomic features of yourself, right? This is the way that we call them, right? You know, um, a lot about an individual just uh, by the sake of, you know, their gender, their age, their race, uh, their postcode. You can say a lot about an individual based on that. So, all these, all these data, all these, um, all these small pieces of information that are then being fed into a model, and then the model would capture all of them with all the perhaps um, skews in it, and produce the decision and produce the decisions based on this model that will stir some action, which then will affect the individuals' lives, and they will continue living their lives producing more data, changing the state of the world, producing more data, and then this will be just reinforced. So 
think about it as a loop. Like what, whatever you're doing with the individual data, it has a very profound impact down the road on the individual lives. So we, as DS practitioners, have this responsibility of making sure that our models do no harm. And this is up to us to use our knowledge, our skills, our deep knowledge of machine learning and knowing and preempting these issues with the power that we have. So I urge you to be very cognizant of that. And whenever you're dealing with the data about the individuals, have it at the back of your mind, raise it to the stakeholders, be very, very vocal about it and really make sure that uh, the models don't go unchecked. So we're gonna we're gonna speak a bit uh, more about it. How uh, on, starting first with a specific example, and then we can think about how we can actually embed the checks uh, into this model life cycle, and what are exact the exact steps that we need to take in order to make sure that our models do no harm. So. Let me start uh, with, with an example of how data can contain societal biases. Our world is a very unfair place, unfortunately, and we're carrying the weight of some historical biases and unfairness. And it's very hard to change the institutions to, to change societal perspectives. And we're making progress, but it's of course very non-uniformly distributed. And still in some areas of our lives, we see very, very big skews and um, very strong existing societal biases. And one example of that can be um, the, the types of occupations um, that differ a lot by gender. So this specific uh, chart on the left uh, represents uh, how the percentage of women is spread across different occupations in the United States. Um, and uh, the y-axis corresponds uh, to the percentage of women in different occupations. And you start uh, at the top with so 100% and you go down to 0%. Uh, and the size of the bubble represents uh, the, the, relative, uh, the relative percentage of, um, of the occupation uh, in, in the society. So the larger the, the size of the bubble, uh, the, more, um, the more workers you have. So, you can see here that um, the, the high, the tall percentage of women um, are, are doing preschool teaching. There are being nurses, there are being librarians. And you go down and you see um, computer programmers and aerospace engineers that are hugely dominated by men. So you can see here that um, this, is, this is very unbalanced. And of course, this is the consequence of a uh, long, long history of, uh, you know, women not being very present in the workforce first and not having the right access to the education. And perhaps, you know, the overall um, image of what, what a woman should do with her life. And this is, this is just the weight of the past that we are carrying, but it is in the data. And if we give this, uh, absolutely unchecked and unchanged to the model, it will only learn that, you know, women are supposed to be nurses and teachers and men are mostly computer engineers and aerospace engineers. And there is not really much, you know, space for women for that. And if we, if we look at the example of how this is actually uh, uh, being reflected in the technology that we're using in the, in this AI technology that we're using, we, we would be <laughs> quite surprised to see that, uh, for instance, when we use a translate, translation engine powered by this exact data, that when we translate from English to Turkish, she's a doctor, he's a nurse, and translate it back to English from Turkish, we would see this exact bias demonstrated here clearly. He is a doctor, the model says. She's a nurse. And just think about what kind of impact it can have on, on the uh, applications that uh, women would, would actually make to become doctors. So think about it. Like if it goes unchecked, a woman who wants to be a doctor might not be given a chance to do that. 
because the algorithm would know that it is a woman and women are not supposed to be doctors. And of course, that would have uh, that would make uh, make it. And of course, it would be detrimental for the woman's career itself, but also for society in general, because this woman would be not given the opportunity to be what she wants to be and um, make this world a bit better. So to make sure that this kind of things don't happen, we again um, need, need to make sure that the algorithmic decision making does not discriminate against different protected groups. We should be very careful not to encode or replicate societal biases, like the one that we just discussed. And we need to make sure that the outcomes of the models do not go unchecked, especially when we know that the risk of discrimination is present. We always should think about what kind of effect it can have on someone down the road, if not, not instantly, you know, several, several years down the road. And we are now at the stage where algorithms are shaping our reality and they are shaping our future. And we should be very careful that we're not carrying the weight of the past with us. So this is, this is up to us and we have this power and we need to use it and we need to use it wisely. So in this regard, let me show you the way we're thinking about it at QB. So um, the life cycle of building ML models that does not account for fairness, it's just a linear process, right? We go to the world, we collect the data, we prepare data for modeling, do um, all the cleaning and filtering and everything. And we then go and uh, take the, the fanciest model from the ML toolkit and build this model and let it learn everything from the data. And we're so happy with its high performance and everyone is happy. Uh, we show beautiful charts and uh, stakeholders are happy. But the, the outcomes are imbalanced. And this is, this is a risk. And if we don't check for it, we just give this model back to the world and it keeps producing imbalanced outcomes and it just learned from, uh, from the data in the past and the, the whole vicious cycle persists. Think about, uh, about the uh, recommendation for instance, for the banking products. Think about the credit score. A queue can have a situation where two individuals that have exactly the same characteristics in terms of their socioeconomic status, everything. They live in a couple, they live in the same neighborhood, they do very similar jobs, but one happened to be a woman and one happened to be a man. And then they're given different scores because the model just picked it up from the data that, you know, on average, we have the, the pay gap and the model knows that uh, perhaps it's uh, safer um, to give a lower score to a woman to achieve higher accuracy, because this is what we're caring about. And this is not the only thing that we should care about. Care about. We should think again about the development of the model in a, in a cycle. So we start with the data collection, cleaning the data, and when we build the models, we need to account for biases. We need not only optimize for accuracy, but we need to make the model know we care about the, the fairness metrics. We care about the biases that exist in, in the data and we don't want to learn from them. So we need to embed it into our model in terms of the regularization term or uh, there are plenty of uh, techniques that allow to do that. So once the model is, is built, yes, it can produce imbalanced outcomes, but they need to go under the checks. And when we run the diagnostics and measure accuracy and fairness, not just the accuracy, not just the performance of the model itself, then we have the chance to correct it with our values in place. We as human beings, we are carrying the, the values and we can inspect the results and see, does it, does it make sense in terms, um, does it make sense for us in terms of fairness? Is the output fair and useful? If it is, wonderful. We have balanced outcomes and we are happy to deploy this model into prod and um, make sure that 
the, 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 out, the outcomes of the models are being used. Otherwise, we go back to the starting point and we revisit the data. Perhaps we're using some transformations of the data or we're using some other in-processing techniques to make sure that the fairness penalty is embedded in our model. Um, and if, if we look at um, this pretty heavy slide, um, here we're trying to summarize all the activities that need to be taken during different steps of this uh, life cycle of, of, of the model, starting from the preparation of the data and the setup, where we need to check what are the legal constraints, what are um, the different uh, the different biases uh, already uh, in the in the in the context, um, and then when we do the detection phase, we actually not only pre-process the data um, the usual way that we do, just you know filling um, missing values or uh, removing them, but we do the checks uh, for fairness, and there is a whole literature dedicated for that with a lot of recommendations on what are exact fairness metrics that one needs to, to be checking for and how to account for that. And once you know that indeed your data is uh, biased and contains the um, contains this, this, this cues, you can account for that. Um, when, when you get to the handling part uh, of this process, you can, ch uh, you can use the model that is relevant for your case and um, again, in fairness, there is a whole bunch of uh, different methods that allow you to account for uh, biases in the data uh, that are broadly divided into pre-processing, in-processing and post-processing methods. And of course, um, you know, I invite you to uh, take a look at this literature. There is a lot out there. Um, and finally, when your model is built and it has this fairness in, in, in ingrained, um, you should keep monitoring. This is the maintaining phase where indeed we're sort of um, bringing this model to life, we are giving it to the world and now it is producing the outputs and now it is affecting people's lives. And we need to make sure that we keep maintaining it. There must be distribution changes, there must be some shifts and we need to account for that. So always, always um, keep, uh, keep monitoring the outputs and if there is something that is not looking right, it is your responsibility to go back and fix it. So in the, in the last uh, few minutes, I just wanted to um, highlight one thing, which is, um, which is you know, the whole complexity of the fairness as the field in general. And uh, from a philosophical perspective, when we, start, uh, when we start thinking about fairness, it's really hard to define it, right? And of course, you would have some differences uh, geographically in terms of what is considered fair and what is not. Um, and even from the mathematical perspective, um, there are so many definitions of fairness, but um, they can't be met and satisfied simultaneously. And, and this is also, you know, uh, one thing that one need to be aware of. Whenever you start doing the fairness checks, you start with the definition of fairness and you need to be very clear of what is fairness to you. So here we're kind of showing different fairness principles. And I just wanted to point you to um, this, this chart uh, with, uh, with kids and, and the trees. And you see the differences between equality and equity. And, uh, you know, this, th this is up to us to define like, what we care about. Do we want to achieve equality or do we want to achieve equity? And this is very hard. And we need to work together with the stakeholders to really understand how we want to shape it. And then we can use our algorithms to account for that. But this step is, of course, very important and very difficult and again this is this is our responsibility and, and this is our joint responsibility and i want you to be to have this at the back of your mind um so i think um this is this is pretty much it and i'm happy to answer any questions um if if you have any 
Thank you very much, Victoria. Um, it's great, great to hear from you. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm afraid, actually, uh, we're actually at time. Um, we we have a hard stop as we need to move on to the, the fireside chats next. Um, but I know we can maybe help answer some of the Q and A's offline um, that we've been receiving. But uh, thank you so much. Uh, Absolutely. Uh,